In today's presentation, I will be talking about how the growth in medicalization of minors with gender dysphoria, the models of care used to treat them, and our views about gender expression and identities are part of sweeping cultural and market changes, all of which impact how we view the ethics of medicalizing gender dysphoria in minors, and all of which we must understand in order to best address the exponential growth in minors presenting at gender clinics. Let me begin by saying that gender nonconforming youth with gender dysphoria experience real distress and deserve respect and optimal ethical care. Medical ethics is founded on the principle of avoiding unnecessary harm. If you can't ask whether a harm is occurring and whether it is necessary, you have no medical ethics. Whether a medical intervention is ethical depends on whether it is necessary, whether there are alternatives, whether the patient has capacity and competency to appreciate the harms and to fully weigh the risks, benefits, and alternatives, whether the patient is free to consent to choose the alternatives, or are they subject to undue influence. In the present case, to properly assess what is ethical care, we must have a clear, firm idea of what may be influencing minors. In the next sections, we will be looking at how and why our health system is incentivized to treat gender nonconforming minors as autonomous medical consumers and competent to consent to transition at younger and younger ages. Gender nonconforming is an umbrella term describing gender expression or gender identity different from gender norms associated with one's birth sex. Some gender nonconforming youth experience gender dysphoria, that is, discomfort or distress that their gender identity or expression does not align with their birth sex. It is based on subjective self-perception and it is emergent from a system of influences. Assessment of gender dysphoria in adolescence is based on their likes and dislikes, including their discomfort with their bodies, how they are treated, and their preferences around behavioral stereotypes. In the last 10 years, minors presenting to gender clinics has increased exponentially. In the past, the majority of minors presenting to gender clinics were under 12 years old and were boys. Now, the majority is adolescent girls. This graph shows the unprecedented increase of girls in the last five years in the UK. Youth experiencing distress with their bodies, gender roles, and identities are in need of care and support, but lifelong medicalization results in significant permanent effects on their health, fertility, and sexual function. It is important to understand what in part may be contributing to the dysphoria and framing it as needing medicalization. Healthcare in the U.S. is based on patient rights and the medical model directly marketed to consumers. Under the medical model, illness, distress, and discomfort, including mental distress, results from physiological factors to the exclusion of other important influences. It is this model which determines how and what we diagnose, treat, and cover. In the last 20 years, the healthcare industry has scaled up based upon this model of care. The U.S. now spends $3.5 trillion on health care. In 10 years, it will double. This growth results from a 20-fold increase of direct-to-consumer marketing on the Internet, creating new markets by presenting breakthrough solutions, identifying brand new problems, redefining existing problems, and using identity branding techniques 
which look at how consumers identify with and are loyal to brands and use consumption to resolve conflicts amongst identities. All designed to capture a broad spectrum of consumers grouped together in economies of scale, like ever-expanding umbrella coverage and services. The result of which is an intense consolidation of the medical industry. and medical information, and a proliferation of health advocacy groups dedicated to patient rights. In concert with the growth of the healthcare industry has been the maturation of patient rights to information, protections, and self-determination, as well as access to medical care through expansion of coverage by government and private programs. This expansion of rights and services has included expanding medical services to minors who may consent as young as 13 years old to certain procedures without parental notification. Under state mature minor exceptions, minors may consent to various treatments including sexual health treatments such as abortions, contraception, prenatal care, and treatments for sexually transmitted diseases. As a result of these changes, access to medical care is now viewed as a right. Care is patient-centered, meaning the care the patient wants is optimized. Gatekeeping is minimized. Patients now shop for providers insurance, and clinicians. Large medical conglomerates now vie for market share and brand capture, with an umbrella of diverse services to a wide array of recipients marketed directly to patients. We now look up our symptoms along with treatments and their side effects before we go to a doctor, and we will question the doctor's diagnosis and treatment plan after seeing them. We will go to chat rooms and talk about our symptoms and treatment plans. And there will be a ready disease advocacy group who will also help us understand our disease and obtain treatment for it. While this system has produced many medical advances and more medical access, it has also resulted in disease mongering, where diagnostic boundaries are widened and treatment promoted to expand markets, such as opioids for pain and where teachers become brokers for ADHD diagnoses. The scaling up of direct marketing has meant the scaling up of marketing to minors as branded individual consumers using the same targeting techniques to verify who we are or want to become and how our consumption enhances or resolves conflict amongst our identities. In this regard, gender has proven to be a very successful marketing tool. But branding products and those who use them as gendered reinforces regressive gender roles and gender expression and dictates the terms of gender self-perception. Where there are rigid gender stereotypes, our ideas about gender and gender expression become more restrictive throughout life. It is so ubiquitous, we don't see how female and male expression is promoted as rigid gender stereotypes. We may think they are innocuous, but advertisers know they impact self-perception and drive behaviors drive viewership, drive influence, drive identity consumption. The ethics of direct marketing to children has been questioned since the 1970s when advertisers began to target market during Saturday morning television cartoons. In the 1990s, the cost for marketing to minors was in the hundreds of millions annually. Now with direct digital access, 
it is in the billions. In the last five years, digital advertising to kids has tripled, and a large chunk of it is on social media, with specialists in social media marketing. Facebook's profitability is not based on selling to you. It is based on selling you. It extracts profile information about you, your interests, habits, likes, and dislikes, and sells that profile to advertisers who use it to target market to you, to shape your behavior, what you buy, what you do, how you think. You are the deliverables Facebook sells. We too have become practiced in branding and delivering ourselves as unique standouts. Gone is advertising as art. It's now all algorithms. Also gone from view are the little gender non-conforming girls who like Legos and might grow up to be same-sex attracted. Like the large corporate entities with expanding product lines that fund them, LGBT organizations have also used the same marketing techniques and goals to become a trusted corporate brand, as well as very big business. Hundreds of millions of dollars are annually granted, donated, and paid to LGBTQ organizations, making them well-funded corporate enterprises in their own right. Through cross-marketing in exchange for mainstream support for the rights of individuals who belong to sexual and gender minorities, LGBTQ organizations deliver an ever-broadening rainbow constituency. In the last 10 years, funding to and services by LGBT organizations have focused on transgender issues. During that time, annual targeted funding to organizations grows threefold, with 90% targeted to transgender services and causes, and no growth to funding to lesbian and bisexual persons, and very little to gay men. In 2012, targeted funds were somewhat equally divided between L, G, B, and T. By 2017, the total amount targeted had doubled, with 70% to trans, three times that of gays, and six times that of lesbians. The dramatic shift away from LGB issues and concerns can be seen in annual reports. Until 2010, GLAD's annual report showed a transgender focus at 25%, but by 2017, it was at 75%, with less than 5% on lesbians. You can see a similar pattern in the HRC annual reports, away from LGB and towards transgender issues during the same period. The most successful LGBT organizations operate as rights lobbyists, medical advocates, and health and service providers, a model first developed in the 1980s and 90s during the AIDS crisis, where organizations acted as medical advocates and formed alliances with the medical and pharmaceutical industry and helped to resolve the crisis by the early 2000s. It was during this time that the gay community centers, like the one established in Los Angeles in the 1970s to provide social services, began to scale up. The LA LGBT Center is now the largest in the world and now has facilities and revenue in the hundreds of millions of dollars through expanding services to a wider range of ages, including intergenerational facilities for seniors and youth and services targeted to the expanding constituencies within the transgender population. LGBT organizations, like the corporate enterprises that fund them, must create new markets to prosper using the same techniques like redefining an existing problem and offering an array of products to solve it. Whether it is sexualities, 
or genders. Creating brand loyalty is the goal. Under a single umbrella, with a virtual limitless menu of choices. You have the right to have what you want, exactly when you want it, because on the menu of life, you are today's special. Exploration of identities and sexualities is an important part of development. Choice is important. But ignoring the context in which GNC youth are coming to understand themselves and the world is unethical. Children and young people are not growing up in a vacuum. Their self-perception is being informed and shaped by the world around them. Jazz and her gender journey are marketed to children but they don't understand the health implications of medically transitioning. We question marketing ethics designed to appeal to minors using cartoon characters and toys that appear friendly and harmless. Similarly, marketing gender identities while masking the medical costs and those who profit from them is unethical. Distress and discomfort with gender stereotypes and our body is not new. It is important to understand how it is being redefined, the breakthrough solutions that are being marketed to address it, and those who are seizing a new opportunity. Gender non-conforming youth deserve attention and care. They also deserve not to have their interests and desires, likes and dislikes, and self-perception turned into a revenue stream under anyone's umbrella. Gender dysphoria is a market, subject to market forces and market forecasts, and the market is expected to grow significantly over the next 10 years. Last year, gender dysphoria was reclassified in the new International Classification of Diseases as Gender Incongruence under Sexual Health, where adolescents are grouped with adults. It is only a matter of time before the mature minor exception is applied to those seeking medical transition under the category of sexual health treatments. Redefining a problem, seizing an opportunity with a breakthrough solution. There are over 35,000 females on GoFundMe seeking online funding for top surgery. The growth of top surgery mirrors the exponential growth in girls presenting at gender clinics. It is a market, and many are looking to get their share. Endowing minors with competency to understand themselves, the influences in their lives, and then to emphasize medical transition and withhold alternative viewpoints and approaches is unethical. There are 16,000 members on Reddit's Detransitioner D Sister forum for whom transition did not resolve their gender dysphoria, identity, or expression, and many others in networks and organizations. There are dozens of videos on YouTube by gender variant young people describing their gender journey and medical transition with more than a million views for each. 
It is a dereliction of the duty of care not to ask how the world around us may be impacting self-perception, our ideas and feelings about gender, when a minor is truly free and capable of consenting to irreversible medical interventions, and what model of care best avoids unnecessary medical harms. How gender non-conforming minors feel about themselves is not wrong. How they express themselves is not wrong. There is nothing wrong with being gender non-conforming. <laughs>